Good afternoon. We have a guest today uh, who is supposed to speak tomorrow. And uh, because of our one constraint, I have asked her favor to reschedule for today because she's all the way from Malaysia. So she will speak not like uh, more than 40 minutes around. And you can ask questions, and we'll wrap up the uh, this class by 5:30. So, Dr. Gita Govinda Swami, she is a Indian Malaysian or Malaysian Indian. I let me, yeah. Uh, she she is working with the University of Malaysia Malaya uh, in Kuala Lumpur, Department of East Asian Study. Faculty of Social Sciences, and she did her PhD from uh, in international relations from University of Monash, Australia, in 2012, and she did her masters in Japan, and then again uh, one of the masters from Cambridge, United Kingdom, and she also did her undergrad from University of Malaysia, and her areas of interest is international relations. North South Korea relations, especially. She is an expert on North South Korea relations. She, her PhD is uh, about uh, North South Korea and Korean foreign policy in an East Asian regionalism. So she did a very nice journal, East Asian Review from Malaysia. And uh, personally, a while ago, she has published one, one of my articles also. And we met in the United States in 2012. She was representing Malaysia as a US. Sushi fellow, and same university we went. The other while ago, when she was, there was a Pakistani professor, Minas. We were together in the United States in 2012 Sushi Fellowship, and uh, it was great to see her here and uh, speak among you. Thank you, Gita, and uh, please well, go ahead. Of uh, masters in international relations and diplomacy, um, the inter-Korean relations or uh, the relationship between North Korea and South Korea is a classic example of peace and conflict studies. Yeah, It's a very classic example because in any textbook that you look at or read, it says that the Cold War is over. The Cold War, the ideological um, um, conflict between um, you know, communism and democracy is over. But that is very untrue. At least in the case of the Korean Peninsula, you have two... Um, countries, yeah, um, same nation, divided by political ideology, same language, but divided by different mentality. One is, of course, as I said, it's a communist country that is in, in the north, um, driven by one family, one single family, dynastic family, the Kim family. Whereas if you look at South Korea, it's, of course, a liberal uh, democratic nation. Um, of course, in between, there, were, there was a military um, uh, administration for like 20 odd years. Um, so the difference in political thinking has brought about a, different, uh, a difference in thinking about how to reunify uh, both Koreas, North Korea and South Korea. Um, what is very interesting is if you look at the constitution of North Korea as well as South Korea, the national objective of both Koreas is to reunify. Yeah, the national objective is to reunify, but any person who reads news on North Korea and South Korea will never believe it. Why? Because there's, they, are, they have a relationship that is very antagonistic, a relationship where uh, civilian North Koreans and South Koreans do not interact. There is no interaction, border crossing between North Korea and South Korea. And in between North Korea and South Korea, you have a demilitarized zone, which I'll talk about afterwards, uh, which is a buffer zone between North Korea and South Korea. So when uh, leaders of both countries, North and South, talk about reunification, it's almost like a joke, almost. Because how do you reunify after almost 70 years of division, right? Because, yeah, it's the same nation, they speak the same language, but how, what is 
the assumptions behind um, what connects them, what connects North Korea and South Korea. Is it religion? Is it uh, politics? Is it ideology? So these are the things that we will look into. Um, my presentation will start a little bit with um, history because, as you know, you need to understand how the division occurred. And um, inter-Korean relations is a subject that is an international subject. Uh, it does not only um, confine, it's not only confined to North Korea and South Korea. It's, it has uh, lots of implications for China, Japan, um, South Korea, North Korea, and even uh, United States. Why United States? Because there are 28,000 uh, US troops in South Korea, 28,000, right? And then um, I think in Japan, another 30,000 US uh, troops. So if anything happens in uh, the Korean Peninsula between North and South, the, the US is there. If the US comes into uh, a conflict between uh, with North Korea, China will get into uh, the conflict. Yeah, so it is an international conflict. It is not an inter-Korean uh, conflict per se. It is an international conflict. And I'm from Malaysia, and uh, Malaysia, as part of Southeast Asia, has lots of uh, economic uh, relationship with China, Japan, and South Korea. So we will be affected in terms of economy. Of course, there's also the question of nuclear development in North Korea. Anything happens, it only it does not only impact on that area. Um, for us, for Malaysians, we call that area Northeast Asia or East Asia. Uh, how do Nepalese um, look at that region? What do you call it? East Asia, Northeast? Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia. No, Southeast Asia would be uh, Malaysia, Singapore, Brunei. You would call it Southeast Asia. No, you call yourself South Asia, but what do you call countries in Japan? East Asia. East Asia. Okay. So I will use the word East Asia because for us, from where we are, we look at it as Northeast Asia. Yeah. So East Asia for you, um, uh, of course, it, as I said, it has lots of implications. Yeah. Um, so I will look into a little bit of the history. I'm sure uh, as. Um, uh, students of uh, international relations, you have learned about Cold War, Korean War, and all those things. Have you? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So you'll understand if I s skip lots of my slides and all that. Okay. Casey, how do I go to the next slide? <laughs> no, it's not going in. Huh? Escape. Escape. Okay. Yeah, well, okay. More no, not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have an iPad. Not necessarily. <laughs> Sorry, I always tease uh, KCG. Um, I find that he's uh, very young at heart. <laughs> Poor man, he's been teased today the whole day. <laughs> okay, so as a single nation, Korea has a history going back to five millennia. Okay, <coughs> however, the first half of the 20th century, we in the 21st century, the first half of the 20th century was marked by Japanese uh, colonial uh, administration, uh, World War II, the Cold War, and the Korean War. Uh, all these wars had impacts on the Korean Peninsula. Yeah? Um, Japan annexed Korea, the Korean Peninsula uh, from 1910 till the end of World War II. I'm sure you know this, right? Um, so when Japan surrendered uh, uh, in World War II, it had to give back all the lands that it colonized. Unfortunately, what happened to Korea was that um, because of the beginning of Cold War between the Soviet Empire and also uh, the uh, US, um, both countries did not want to give up the Korean Peninsula because it was a very strategic um, uh, point for them, a country that was in a very strategic location. So what happened was they um, decided to have a trusteeship. A trusteeship is something like, I will look after this particular land for a couple of years, and after that, the people of that land would be given independence. Yeah? So you might ask, what was the uh, reaction from the Koreans themselves? Right? The reactions from the Koreans themselves is that, of course, they were against the trusteeship. 
they were against. But they did not have any political clout because they were under colonial uh, uh, you know, administration for 35 years where the Japanese were actually very cruel to them. That is why if you look at anything uh, to do with Japan-South Korea relations now, you have this feeling that there is mutual distrust between uh, Korea and Japan, yeah? And that started from that annexation of 35 years. Um, so because of that, we see um, that the Soviet Union and uh, America looked at the Korean Peninsula as a place where they could fight their war. A cold war actually is not a physical war. It is an ideological war, right, between um, uh, communism and democracy. So in Asia, if you look at any textbook on international relations, the Cold War actually started in Asia in the Korean Peninsula. The Korean Peninsula was the pro proxy war, war that was fought between the Soviet Union and the US, but the people that were the victims were the Koreans, and they are still the victims of that Cold War, which has not ended in um, the Korean Peninsula. So whatever books that you read that says that the Cold War is over, sorry to say, in Asia it has not. Because if you look at uh, examples of Vietnam, right? Vietnam, you had North Vietnam, South Vietnam, uh, but today you have one Vietnam, so it reunified. If you look at Germany, the case of Germany, you had East Germany, West Germany, but today it's reunified. If you look at Korea, the last 60 years, it has not reunified. Yeah? Any questions so far? No? Okay, uh, I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Okay, so there was reaction from the uh, uh, Korean political leaders who some of them were actually exiled during uh, the Japanese colonialism, yeah? Uh, so Korean political leaders who carried on the independence movement during the Japanese colonization called for the establishment of an independent and unified Korea. In 1947, the US submitted the issue of Korean independence to the uh, United uh, Nations General Assembly, and eventually the UN accepted the resolution with a general election set in the new, near future. So. From the beginning, the minute uh, Japan surrendered Korea, the Korean Peninsula, the United Nations was involved, the US was involved, and Soviet Union was involved. However, uh, a conflict erupted between the supporting and the opposing forces of the trusteeship of North and South Korea, uh, 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 resulting in a greater gap between what to do. You know, the, the question was, what can be done to Korea? Because both Soviet Union and uh, the, Ameri uh, the, the Americans were very interested in retaining influence in the Korean Peninsula. Yeah? Retaining influence here means uh, spreading the ideology, respective ideology in the Korean Peninsula. If you look at the map of the Korean Peninsula, um, sorry, this is the only map that I could get, and it had to be put in that way so that everything could be fit, all the pictures. If you look at it, um, the northern part, China and Russia are much nearer to North Korea. So that is why you have that communist in influence in the northern part. And the southern part, South Korea today, um, the, uh, the block, the, the democratic block in Asia, where you have Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, all under during the Cold War, all under uh, American influence, yeah? And the Americans, um, two officers in the middle of the night at 12 o'clock uh, sat in an office at a table and looked at the, um, the map of Korea and decided to draw a line between North and South. And they chose 38th, 38th parallel, which till today, is the division of North and South Korea. If you look at uh, you know maps, the parallels are usually straight lines, right? But then, of course, if you look at the map in uh, Korea today, after the Korean War, it was redrawn, but still it is actually 38 parallel, yeah? So that is the division that started in 1945, which exists till 2014. Okay. Um, uh, the United Nations agreed to have elections, yeah, agreed to have elections in the North and South, 
But unfortunately, the Soviet uh, Union did not want elections that were sponsored by the United Nations, right? So what happened was only in the South, they had elections under the Americans. And when this happened, South became a country on, of its own. And North later, a month later in September, became a country of its own in the North. Now this, this division was supposed to be very temporary until the Koreans themselves could decide that they could um, manage themselves, administer themselves, yeah? This was the perception. Now, international relations, as you know, is all perception. What I see, I'm sitting, I'm standing here, I'm looking at you, I have one perception. You are sitting there and you're looking at me and you have a different perception of me, right? So both perceptions need not be the same. They are totally different. Because your experiences are different, my experiences are different. So the same thing. For the Soviet Union, they did not want to let go of the Korean Peninsula because they wanted the peninsula to be a communist enclave in Asia. Now, if you look back at the um, map, China at this point in time, 1948-49, was already a communist country. Yeah, in 1949, it became a communist country. So if the Soviet Union could spread the ideology, the communist ideology, then the peninsula would be fully co communized. Yeah? So he did not want to, Soviet Union did not want to give away to South Korea. Unfortunately, uh, the Americans, of course, had their own uh, elections, and Syngman Rhee, uh, who was very pro-American, there were many Korean leaders uh, on the Korean Peninsula, as well as outside Korea, who were fighting for Korean in independence. But Syngman Rhee was chosen by the Americans. Of course, America played politics, the Soviets also played politics. Um, as I started earlier, I said that in, in the North, only one family has been ruling North Korea. And that family is the Kim family. Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, and now uh, is Kim Jong-un. That little teddy bear there, he is Kim Jong-un. Yeah, he looks like a teddy bear if you look at him. Yeah, so he, he's from the same family, so it's dynastic. And this came about because the Soviet Union uh, chose Kim Il-sung, the grandfather, as the leader of uh, the, oh, thank you very much, as the leader of, as the leader of North Korea. Um, okay, so if you look at the map, between 1945 to 1948, the map shows the Cold War, and between 1948 to 2014, uh, when elections were not held in the North by the United Nations, but were held in the South by the United Nations, you had two different countries opposing um, ideology, opposing influences, North influenced by China, because China was already a country at that point in time, a communist ally of uh, North Korea. Soviet Union was already a ally. So you had um, North Korea being developed with assistance and aid, monetary aid, technical aid from uh, China as well as um, the, the Soviet Union. Now, the South, of course, America and Japan aided South Korea in, uh, in its economy, in its development and all that. Um, uh, what is very interesting is, as I said, the, the um, demarcation, the 38th parallel is the same till today. Yeah? Only the, what, would, uh, what one would say is, what has changed is the influences have changed. Because after the Cold War, um, again, if the Cold War has really ended, it ended in the early 1990s, 89, 90, 91, right? So when that ended, North Korea, which had um, lots of backing from the Soviet empire, lost its backing because there was no longer an empire. So what was left was Russia, the Russian Federation. But as you know, Russian Federation was going into, was trying to become a democratic nation, so it had its own problems to deal with. So uh, no longer was there much influence from Russia towards North Korea, yeah? So China became the main ally, and till today, China is the main ally for North Korea. If you look at, um, I think North Korea, as you know, is famous for its nuclear development. So every time there's a nuclear test, 
or uh, North Korea uh, threatens to have a nuclear test because now the latest uh, warning is that there would be a, a, a another nuclear test. This would be the fourth nuclear test from North Korea. Uh, the backing it always comes from China, yeah, and China is a member of the Security Council. But unfortunately, um, though China is a member of the Security Council, China has its own foreign policy dilemma uh, because. Does it uh, support America in sanctioning North Korea? Does it support South Korea in sanctioning North Korea? Or does it look after its own borders? Because uh, China shares the same border with North Korea. If anything happens in North Korea, you'll have North Koreans fleeing into China. China already has, what, 1.3 billion people? Does it need more ethnic Koreans coming into its territory? So these are the foreign policy dilemma, as I said, is perception. From China, the perception is very different from South Korea looking upwards and from America looking, you know, the other side of the continent. But then again, all these perceptions are very valid because th these perceptions uh, allow these countries to make policies uh, that are based on national interests, national sovereignty, national uh, uh, and uh, territorial integrity and all those things, yeah? So these are very important. We cannot say that one perception is right and the other perception is wrong. It doesn't work like that. In international relations, there's no black and white. You have many theories, but it does not mean each theory fits each uh, case study. Like in the Korean Peninsula, I cannot actually tell you it's uh, I mean, if I use realism, that it can actually explain what is happening in the Korean pen Peninsula. Because there's also cultural differences, yeah, ideological differences. Economic is also uh, a factor. Yeah? So you can look at political economy, you can look at constructivism, which uh, looks at um, culture. Yeah? So these are the factors that one has to look into when one looks at the uh, uh, Korean Peninsula. Yeah? Uh, so, the other uh, reason or the other factor that one has to look into when one looks at the Korean uh, crisis is the Korean War. Though in 1948, um, there, uh, there, there began two Koreas, as I said, it was supposed to be very temporary because both Koreas wanted to reunify, right? But from 1948 to 1950, many things changed. Uh, example, in the South, um, Americans were very influential, right? But in, by 1949, America was more interested in Europe, was more interested in what was happening in Eastern Europe, and it was not uh, concentrating on South Korea. So what happened was it withdrew its troops from South Korea. When it withdrew its troops from South Korea, uh, the North Koreans were watching, you know, they want, this was for them uh, a golden opportunity to reunify the peninsula because uh, Americans were not helping the South Koreans anymore, yeah? Uh, of course, this gave the opportunity for North Korea with the backing, again, from the Soviet Union and China to invade uh, South Korea, yeah? They almost succeeded. They almost succeeded. What uh, was the interesting thing was when they almost succeeded in reunifying the peninsula, the Americans got interested again because they didn't want, they did not want the peninsula to fall into the communist trap because Japan was already uh, democratized, uh, democrat uh, democratized. Taiwan was already democratized, right? So they want the South Korea, that part of uh, the uh, Southern uh, Peninsula, to be still the part of the democratic bloc. So they went back into South Korea. How did they go back into South Korea? They went through the United Nations again. So um, America plus 15 other nations took part in the war against North Korea. 16 other nations, yeah? So the Korean War, you know, started in 1950. Till today, it hasn't ended because it went on till 1953. There were no winners, there were no losers. Um, one million civilians died. Two million soldiers uh, died. Many more were injured. Um, the war also created um, 
separations of families between North and South. Yeah? So at the end of the day, what happened was the United Nations, uh, North Korea and China, as well as the US, sat together and they started negotiating how to stop the war. Not end the war, but how to stop the war. So what happened? To, towards the end, they had an armistice. An armistice simply means that they will not fight. They will stop fighting. It does not mean that it is the end of a war, right? So that means till today, technically, according to law, international law, the Korean Peninsula is actually at war. It's a war zone. North Korea and South Korea, because there's no peace treaty. A war has to be ended. There is no peace treaty, yeah? So technically, it's a war zone. So if you, if you have ever happen to go to North Korea or South Korea, because you're one of those very lucky ones, like Malaysians, where you can go to both North and South Korea. And I hear from KCG that uh, North Korea also has an embassy or a consulate. Yeah, yeah. OK, you have an embassy. Mm. Yeah, very few uh, countries have both uh, embassies or consulates, yeah? So if you're actually, you know, uh, either in North Korea or South Korea, you're actually in a war zone. And more so, it is, uh, it is a zone that is supposed to be a war zone, but there's still peace there. It's like a status quo, you know? The war is in the shadows, but there's peace, because they're not fighting because of the armistice. And every time... North Korea warns South Korea that there's going to be a, um, um, you know, another nuclear test, that it's going to attack um, uh, Seoul, the, the capital of South Korea. They will always say, oh, we no longer adhere to the armistice agreement. So six or seven times they've said that they are not, uh, they are out of this armistice agreement where they have said that they will stop fighting. So anytime they want to fight, they can fight because they're out of that agreement yeah so anyway it's a war zone so the korean war again became a factor in uh, lengthening the division between north and south because what happened after the korean war was you actually had the actual demarcation line that this is the 38th parallel when the two officers the american officers drew the line it was a very straight line but today it, it juts down so some parts of uh, North Korea became South Korea, and some parts of South Korea became North Korea. Now, this is a demilitarized zone. It's supposed to be a neutral zone. It's supposed to be a buffer zone between North and South. Uh, Panmunjom is where they had the, um, the, the armistice agreement. Yeah? Today, Panmunjom, uh, as a neutral area, is being uh, administered, looked after, not by North or South Korean soldiers, but by a Swiss um, a, um, contingent, yeah? Swiss and Swedish uh, contingent. Now, if you look at the line, yeah, a contingent is like a group of people, officers, who... Uh, they have like pistols and all that, but they are actually supposed to be the neutral force in that neutral area. Mm. Yeah? Okay. Though this uh, DMZ, we call it DMZ, demilitarized zone, is supposed to be neutral, but on the northern part and on the southern part, you have a lot of soldiers, you have camps, military camps. So this is actually the most heavily militarized zone outside of the neutral zone. Yeah? Uh, and if you look at Seoul, Seoul is the capital of South Korea. If today there was a war, if today North Korea attacked Seoul or attacked South Korea, the target would be Seoul because Seoul is only like 40 kilometers from this demilitarized zone. Almost half of the population of South Korea lives in Seoul because Seoul has everything. It's the modern capital, best schools are there, best universities are there, the best jobs are there. So. A lot of South Koreans flock to Seoul. That's where they will want to work, want to live. Yeah. So if I'm a North Korean soldier, if I can capture Seoul, uh, the, uh, the entire uh, South Korean would fall uh, very quickly. Within days, it will fall. So you might ask why they have not um, relocated the capital. I don't know. I have never got the answer. But the capital has been the capital since the division. Yeah. It's only 40 kilometers. But if you look at Pyongyang, Pyongyang, Pyongyang is like so far north. So there is no chance that South Korea, if it attacks North Korea, will be able to capture Pyongyang so quickly. 
Yeah. So this uh, map is very important if you want to know about North Korea, South Korea uh, division because, as I said, it serves as a, bus, a buffer zone between North and South Korea. At the same time, as I always point out, uh, this uh, Korean crisis is an international crisis. So China, which borders with North Korea, wants the steam militarized zone to be there, to be a reality, because it does not want the 28,000 uh, American soldiers that are in South Korea to go up to the north, because the next target would be China, right? So for them, uh, the lip service, lip service here means in paper, when politicians uh, meet uh, with North Korean, so, uh, 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 you know, leaders, South Korean leaders, American leaders, on paper they will say, "Oh, we want reunification. We want a peaceful, a stable Korean Peninsula." But in reality, they want that buffer zone to be there forever because they do not want Americans to cross North Korea and come into. Uh, China, because during the Cor uh, Korean War, uh, when General MacArthur of uh, the American forces, the UN forces, he was the head of the UN forces, um, he was very determined to cross, when he invaded North Korea, he was very determined to cross the Yalu River. Yalu River is the river that um, um, is the uh, division between North Korea and China. He was very, very, uh, uh, you know, um, he would really wanted to move into China. But uh, President Truman said, no, the problem here is with North Korea. The fight is not with China. Yeah. So he was actually sacked by President Truman for wanting to bomb China even in 1950, in 1950, 1951. Yeah? So the Chinese have this uh, perception that if the demilitarized zone uh, you know, disappears and uh, American troops cross over to North Korea, the next target would be China. So in reality, they do not want the, the reunification of uh, North Korea and South Korea. Okay, uh, so the demilitarized zone is 250 kilometers long, four kilometers wide, the most heavily mili militarized border in the world. As I said, the zone itself is supposed to be neutral, but north and the south, you have lots of camps, military camps. Until very recently, in the southern part of the demilitarized zone, the Americans were... Um, uh, the ones who are guarding the uh, border, but now uh, the Koreans are guarding the border, the South Koreans are guarding the border. Yeah? And then the northern limit line, um, northern limit line on that side, this is the sea border. Yeah? Uh, there's always a lot of skirmishes, little, little fights between North Korean fishermen and South Korean fishermen, because when you are at sea, how do you know where the line is? Yeah, you're a fisherman. How do you know where the line is, right? So this actually becomes little, little uh, fights here and there. And the other thing that happened in 2010 is, after the Korean War, there were many incidents where North Korean agents crept into South Korea. Um, North Korean agents actually attacked the Blue House. Blue House is the presidential house of the South Korean president. Yeah, All these incidents happened. And at the same time, uh, these were all considered very small incidents, but in 2010, uh, a North Korean torpe torpedo actually torpedoed a South Korean um, ship, uh, which is called, uh, I think, Chonan. Yeah, so that became, um, you know, a huge uh, uproar. It created a huge uproar internationally and also in South Korea, and it happened at the northern uh, limit line. Yeah, it happened at the northern, northern limit line and. Uh, a lot of analysts, um, pol political analysts, actually thought there would be another uh, second Korean War, meaning maybe North will invade, uh, you know, attack uh, South Korea. It didn't happen, but relations became worse, or they were already worse, but it became worse. If uh, there's another word in English that I can say, more than worse is worse, <laughs> yeah? Um, and that created a lot of tension again and again. Now, this is the uh, demilitarized zone. If you go to the demilitarized zone, if you look at the gray building at the back, that's North Korea. Uh, then you see the blue buildings. The blue buildings uh, signify the line, the 30th, 38th parallel. And in front of the blue building is uh, South Korea. 
right? Now, um, as a Malaysian, I've been to uh, Panmunjom because if you are Korean from either side, you cannot go to Panmunjom. You're not allowed to go to Panmunjom, yeah? So as a, uh, a tourist in South Korea, I took a tour to uh, this area. This area is called uh, the Joint Security Area. Uh, uh, the person who asked about the contingent, right? So uh, the, the uh, group of uh, Swedes and um, the Swedish uh, officers, right? They are always uh, in the blue building because that is the imaginary uh, division, the 38th parallel, yeah? Uh, and North Korean and South Korean soldiers face each other. They can only have a pistol. They can't have a a AK-46 uh, or 16 or whatever, right? They are not allowed to have, have firearms except uh, pistols. And they look at each other, but they do not talk to each other. They are not supposed to talk to each other. As a tourist, when you go, it's very interesting. As a tourist, when you go, you are allowed to go into the blue building, which is the imaginary line. If I am a tourist from South Korea, I can only stand in the blue building at the South Korean line. I cannot put even one leg in North Korea, not allowed, yeah? So the tension, the division is that bad. The, uh, both the soldiers, the black uh, uniformed soldiers are South Korean soldiers. On the other side where they are sharing guns, I think I'm not sure what they're doing. That's a North Korean soldier, right? And then the gray building behind, when you are on this side, you can see people watching you. You are being, I mean, you're being, I mean, the surveillance is terrible. You can see people watching you. And when you're going to this area, you are, as a tourist, you are told not to show your hand, not to smile at the soldiers, not to do anything that would indicate that we are teasing them or anything. Because there have been incidents where uh, northern, um, someone from the northern side running into the southern side, yeah? So that would mean soldiers will start fighting with each other and the person who runs either side gets killed. Yeah? And more so as a tourist. If you're an American tourist, you're a fantastic target for the North Koreans. As a Malaysian, I'm not, but if you're an American, you're a fantastic target. Yeah? So very interesting. This is, uh, if you ever get a chance, please go. Because it, it doesn't matter whether you're in North Korea or South Korea, you can actually go to the Everything that I'm telling you, uh, mostly is very biased because the information that I have I have comes from South Korea because information from North Korea is very little and whatever that comes out of uh, North Korea it's very debatable it's very questionable because nothing comes out of North Korea how do this okay how do uh, the Japanese the South Koreans the Chinese uh, the Americans uh, learn about North Korea is through refugees and intelligence reports and through tourists that have gone into North Korea because North Korea is a very isolated country, extremely isolated. Um, to go there, it's so difficult. You know, unless you're a Malaysian, you can actually fly directly from Kuala Lumpur to Pyongyang. We actually have Air Koryo, which is not uh, certified by any uh, aviation bodies. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know why the Malaysian government allows that, but uh, Air Korea actually, uh, you know, comes to Kuala Lumpur and there's a direct flight uh, to North Korea. Uh, in most cases, if people want to go to Pyongyang or North Korea in any of the cities, they have to go to Beijing and from Beijing take a flight to uh, Pyongyang. Uh, so. The information that comes from North Korea is very, very questionable, yeah? So uh, a lot of the information, as I said, comes from refugees. A lot of North Koreans, um, they are actually living in poverty, yeah? Because it's a dynastic family, the country is propped up by the military as well as the Kim family, okay? Two factors, the Kim family and the military. Uh, the people come way below, they are not that important. Yeah, the Kim family is important and the Kim family gets support from the military. If there is supposed to be change in North Korea, it will not come from the people. The civil society doesn't exist because they are so guarded in uh, North Korea. Yeah? So the, uh, any changes will only come with it from the military themselves. If, let's say in, within the military there's factions and they start fighting with each other and they, uh, and they go against the Kim family. 
Yeah, so that is the only way, and we don't know, again, we don't know what is happening, because last December, uh, the, uh, the leader of uh, North Korea, Kim Jong-un, who's only 30 years old, I'm sure some of you are like 30 years old here or younger. Um, he's only 30 years old and he was he consolidated his power by uh, assassinating his uncle. His uncle, Chang Song Tech, uh, was the intelligence head for North Korea. Yeah, so he actually uh, assassinated him and assassinated all those associated with Chang Song Tech including, I'm very sorry to say, the North Korean ambassador to Kuala Lumpur, who was recalled and never came back. So we assume that he's dead. Because he never came back. And we don't have another uh, North Korean ambassador. We have an embassy, but we don't have an ambassador. And no news about what happened to the man, poor man. But we know that he was very closely aligned to Chang Song Tech. And Chang Song Tech became a threat to the young leader because Chang Song Tech wanted uh, reforms, economic reforms, right? But if you have economic reforms, North Korea uh, will prosper, but the Kim regime will collapse. Because how does a regime like the Kim family control everything? By stopping information from coming into the country from outside, right? Everything is controlled by one family and the military. So uh, Chang Song Tech became a threat to the uh, young leader. And the, I, I say young leader because he's only been the leader of North Korea for the past two years, 2011. December 2011 when his father died, suddenly he's the third son. He's not even the first son. The first son was uh, put aside. Second son lives uh, in exile in either Macau or Singapore. Again, uh, we don't know where, right? Uh, so he's the third son in the family. Usually Korean families, uh, or in any confusion uh, family, the first son inherits everything, you know, from wealth, to the title, to everything. So in this case, the father, Kim Jong-il, uh, appointed the third son as the leader, supreme leader of North Korea. So again, as I said, so the information that comes is uh, unreliable, questionable, debatable. And so most of the information comes from refugees. Who are these refugees? These refugees are North Koreans who try to leave their country by, uh, they cannot cross the DMZ. As I said, it's close to uh, North Koreans and South Koreans, yeah? So what they do is they uh, try to cross the border into China, and if they are not sent back by the Chinese government, you see, the Chinese government is quite, um, I would say, very cruel, you know, but this is personal opinion, yeah? Very cruel because they don't allow these uh, refugees who are suffering, uh, who are living in poverty, to, li uh, to live in China or even let them go to a third country. You know, they send them back into uh, North Korea. So those who escape, actually escape and then come into uh, Southeast Asia, either through Thailand, Burma, uh, you call it Myanmar or Burma? Myanmar, okay, we call it Burma, so Myanmar, Thailand, uh, and then they go into uh, uh, South Korea. So once they actually reach into South Korea, uh, they are taken care of the South, uh, taken care by the South Korean government. Yeah, so I think at the moment there are around 30,000 North Korean refugees who made it into South Korea. So they are uh, rehabilitated, given jobs. <laughs> And you must understand that these people have lived in a system where everything uh, was very controlled, right? So they had to, when they come into South Korea, they have to learn how to live in a very free world. Because South Koreans are, uh, I mean, they, they uh, value freedom, they value individual rights, because it's a capitalist country, right? So all these things are very new. And then, uh, so these uh, South, sorry, North Korean refugees have to be rehabilitated, they have to be re-educated into living in normal, what we call as normal society. You and I live in a normal society, yeah? Compared to a North Korean who lives in North Korea, yeah? Uh, so it's quite interesting. Um, though what I'm saying comes from South Korea and you know, snippets from uh, Japanese intelligence and uh, American intelligence, uh, we still have to know what is happening in North Korea, right? So they, uh, they've they had three leaders, all from the same family, Kim Il-sung, the father of uh, North Korea, then his son Kim Jong-il, and now Kim Jong-un. And three leaders have left their legacy 
through their policies, and one of it, of course, is Juche, Songun, and Pyongjin. Now, Juche means self-reliance. Uh, what this means is, we always say North Korea is a communist country, but actually it's not really a communist country. They have their own philosophy. Yeah, Their philosophy is to be self-reliant, uh, not to um, depend on others. Others here means Westerners. Westerners here actually means the Europeans and the Americans. They do not want America to interfere. Yeah? This was under Kim Il-sung. Uh, and this policy is still part of the national policy of uh, North Korea. Then when Kim Jong-il came into the picture, after the father died in 1994, he came out with a new policy which is uh, termed as Songun. Songun means military first. As I said, when you look at the um, structure, political structure in North Korea, you have the supreme leader, Kim, either Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, or Kim Jong-un, and the military, because they prop each other up. They have to support each other. If they don't support each other, one will collapse. Yeah. So if the military and uh, the Kim family, and the Kim family under Kim Jong-un, uh, sorry, under Kim Jong-il, realized that it needs the military. So how do you uh, retain the support of the military? By giving uh, assistance by prioritizing the military. So Songun means military first. Yeah, military first. So the military uh, example, um, in North Korea, everyone, men and women, have to go for military training. It's conscription, yeah? It's like uh, four or five years of their lives, they have to go for military training. So every, essentially, everyone is a soldier in North Korea. So if you look at it, they have the largest standing army, besides uh, China, of course, because China, because of the population. Huh? But North Korea, it's because every person has to have military training. In South Korea, it's uh, for women, it's voluntary. For men, they have to go, but it's only 26 months. So men, uh, after high school, they have to go. Sorry, they have to go for military training and then they go into university. So when they finish university, they're a bit older than the women who go into university straight away after high school. So when they come out and find jobs, they get higher salaries than the women because they've already gone through this military training for 26 uh, months and all that, right? Uh, so this is the South Korean uh, military training. The North men and women have to go for military training. So by putting the military first, you are, uh, the Kim family ensured that the family will be sustained with the support of the military. Yeah? Now the latest uh, policy under Kim Jong-un is called Pyongjin. Pyongjin means military and economic development because uh, for the last 20, 25 years after the Korean War, uh, North Koreans have been living in utter poverty. Um, um, there's no agriculture to speak of. Um, there have been too many floods, yeah? mismanagement of economy. If you look at China, it is a communist country, but the central command is very capitalist in its nature when it comes to economic development. North Korea is not. North Korea still adheres to central command. Yeah? So economic mismanagement was rampant, meaning uh, you know, normal people did not get food. If you go to North Korea, when I went to uh, North Korea to one of the projects that were being done, uh, when I had to write my PhD thesis, I was told by my supervisor to go to North Korea. So I had to go. I'll tell you about that experience afterwards. Very interesting also. Uh, so, you know, when you go, at that point in time, the DMZ was open for foreigners. Not for North Koreans, South Koreans, but for foreigners. So I went through the DMZ. The minute you go into the northern part, the North Korean part, you don't see trees at all. It's very uh, bare. You know, uh, the Korean landscape is very mountainous like Nepal. Uh, but in South Korea, you will see trees uh, in the mountains, yeah? But in North Korea, you don't see trees. After uh, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, the whole place is in darkness. There's no electricity, not enough electricity. Everything is in darkness. If you uh, Google North Korean map at night, you know, there'll be probably one or two lights because 
they don't have enough energy. They live in utter poverty. Yeah. So what do they do? They have to uh, cut down the trees in the mountain for heat because uh, they have very harsh winters. Hmm? Uh, for fi fire, uh, wood, you know, to cook and all those things. So everything comes from the forest. So they don't have trees. Um, so uh, as a repercussion of these policies, mismanagement and the floods and all those things, uh, the economy fared very badly. So under this new leader now, this young uh, teddy bear, 30 years old, uh, he says now that the military has to be, a military and economic development has to be given equal um, emphasis. Yeah, But if you want to give equal emphasis, how do you give equal emphasis to economic development without investments coming into the country? How do you um, uh, develop an economy without financial backing? Because North Korea is a very isolated country. It does not have any, or it, it has very little connection to the outside world. Example, I'm sure Nepal has, Casey, you were saying about aid coming from Euro the European Union, ADB, World Bank, and all that, right? North Korea doesn't have that uh, avenue at all because of the sanctions, because of the North Korean nuclear development. The Americans, the European Union, uh, members of the European Union have imposed sanctions on North Korea, which means North Koreans cannot, the government and the people, cannot get a loan from the World Bank. They can't get a loan from the ADB uh, Bank, you know. So the sanctions that uh, are imposed on North Korea actually doesn't work that much because North Korean economy is not uh, integrated into the world economy. If you are integrated into the world economy, then you'll feel uh, hurt, you know, when you can't get loans and all that, but they, they are not, yeah? So because of this, uh, however, I don't know how the economic development is going to happen, but uh, Kim Jong-un, the young leader, has decided that certain parts, you know, certain zones of uh, North Korea will be opened uh, for foreign investments. 14 zones will be open for foreign investments. So we'll see how it goes, whether North Korea will collapse or whether North Korea will prosper. Yeah? North Korea is seen as the clandestine uh, nuclear state. You know, you have five legal nuclear states in the world. The rest are all clandestine because uh, they have not adhered to the non-proliferation uh, treaty, right? So North Korea came out of that uh, treaty in 1993, I think, if I'm not mistaken, yeah? And the issue of uh, nuclear and also chemical and biological uh, weapons development, um, it's very difficult to negotiate with the North Koreans because every time you negotiate, uh, you meaning Americans, the European Union, members of the uh, European Union, or even Japan or South Korea, every time North Korea comes to the um, negotiating table, it wants something. So for it, the nuclear development is a bargaining chip. I give you something, you give me something. Yeah. So every time an agreement is signed, they will sign the agreement, but later on they will not keep to the agreement. Yeah? This happened in 1993, 1994, 2006, 2009. Every year they'll have an agreement, but they will not keep to the agreement. Example, the biggest crisis, there has been two nuclear crises. The biggest crisis was in 1993 because, uh, okay, so they said they are going to, you know, attack uh, South Korea, especially Seoul. So the Americans got involved, South Koreans, Japan, everyone got involved and uh, it was agreed. This is called the Geneva Agreed, uh, agreed Framework. It was agreed that uh, uh, Americans will provide um, uh, free uh, oil to um, North Korea if they stop um, the development, uh, the nuclear development. So of course North Korea signed you know, and after like 10 years, North Korea, we, uh, in 2002, yeah, in 2002, uh, it was found out that while they agreed to stop, uh, you know, producing, they actually were producing, okay? Their uh, argument was, well, the 1993 nuclear development was based on uranium, while we were developing a nuclear development based on plutonium. 
Yes, very interesting, isn't it? So they play with words. Actually, they are right. Because the agreement was uranium. Nobody thought about plutonium. Because I think nobody knew that they had plutonium, right? So very interesting. So this is how they play around. And then uh, in 2006, again, there was another agreement. Uh, later, uh, North Korea said, well, we signed the agreement, but you did not do A, B, C, D, E, F. So we are not going to adhere to the uh, agreement. So it is very difficult to negotiate with a country that does not keep to its promises. Yeah, that is one. Second, we must understand that nuclear development, this chemical, this biological development, uh, is a defense mechanism for them because they don't have anything else. They are not economically vibrant. If you look at South Korea, it's, it, it's an economic powerhouse. Japan is an economic powerhouse. China is an economic powerhouse. So they're surrounded by economic powerhouses, except for North Korea, there's nothing, right? So this is a defense mechanism, and that is why uh, Kim Jong Un, the leader, the young leader, says that okay, we have to do, we have to um, develop the economy, but at the same time, the military and the nuclear development has to go on also. It has to be parallel, two track. Yeah, it has to be parallel. Uh, and of course, this poses a lot of problems for um, countries like South Korea, North uh, South Korea, Japan, China, and even uh, America. America because North Korea always says that it wants to attack America. It has missiles, but the missiles can, oh, don't laugh, it might happen one day. No, honestly, it might happen, because uh, they have missiles that work. The missiles work. Unfortunately, it's not, the distance is not far enough. They have 200 kilometers, 500 kilometers, but to reach Alaska, they need at least 1,500 kilometers, yeah? So that one hasn't, uh, been achieved yet, so that's number one. Number two, let's say they do have that distance, the missiles that go to that distance, then they'll need, need to have that technology to put the nuclear warhead onto that missile to attack America, yeah? So these things might happen in the future. Uh, since we don't know what is happening in North Korea, we should never discount what is um, the possibility that uh, lies in their nuclear development, yeah? Uh, okay, so Again, when I started, I said that both constitution, North, North uh, Korean constitution and South Korean constitution uh, says its national objective is reunification. Now, America is, is worried, China is worried, uh, Japan is worried because they, they are all neighbors, but the most worried uh, nation, of course, is South Korea, immediate neighbor, right? If you look at the map, immediate neighbor. And if something happens, if let's say North Korea collapses for whatever reason, what would happen is the refugees would enter uh, China as well as uh, South Korea. And South Korea is a very vibrant democracy, vibrant uh, in terms of economic development. Yeah, Until the 1997 crisis, it, was, it had the top 10 uh, economies in the world, but now it's like number 11, 12, or 13, according to the year. But still, it's a very vibrant economy. So having a vibrant economy, they want to sustain that economy. They do not want refugees coming from the north. Yeah, They do not want uh, the Korean Peninsula to collapse, North Korea to collapse, because if that happens, <coughs> their economy will be affected. Yeah, So, uh, no, uh, South Korean leaders, like uh, North Korean leaders, have come up with policies to deal with North Korea. Okay, So these are some of the policies, not politic, sunshine policy, policy for peace and prosperity, vision 3000, trust politic, and all those things. Now what is interesting here is, not politic example, um, this was, uh, do you know the 1988 Olympics was held in Seoul? Yeah, okay. Uh, so prior to that, um, the South Koreans were very worried because um, as I said to you earlier, there have been incidents where North Korean agents have come into South Korea. They have dug tunnels in the DMZ zone. There are like four or five tunnels where they have dug into the South Korean uh, border and all that. Yeah, so they, they were very worried that the 1988 Seoul Olympics would be disrupted. So they wanted to make sure that the Olympics was would 
you know, go without any incidents. They started having negotiations, having um, official uh, uh, relations with communist, with the communist bloc, especially China, Russia, Eastern, uh, uh, Eastern Europe. At that point in time, was still within the Cold War uh, period, right? Uh, and one of the reasons why they wanted to have, because they couldn't negotiate directly with North Korea, they thought that if they could negotiate with the Eastern Bloc, the Communist Bloc, then the Communist Bloc would try to bring North and South together. Yeah. So that was the North politic, uh, though it did not uh, come into. I mean bring about a reconciliation, but uh, it was a success, the North politic, because the 1988 uh, Olympics went without, went on without any problems, yeah? So for them, that was quite a success. Then the other policy that was quite successful, I would say, uh, is the Sunshine Policy and the Policy for Peace and Prosperity. If you know anything about South Korean um, politics, uh, they are divided into two political camps. Um, they have uh, progressive leaders as well as conservative leaders. Now, the conservative leaders are very uh, against North Korea, very anti-North Korea. Progressive leaders are for North Korea, meaning that they want to have better relations with North Korea. Now, the problem is that from 1948, when you had two, um, you know, two different uh, countries, in, in South Korea, they have this... Um, law that is called the National Security Law, which prohibits South Koreans of having any relationship with North Korea. Okay? And this came under the conservative leadership. But when for the first time in 2000, uh, sorry, 1998, for the first time, the progressive leaders uh, came into power, they wanted to change the mentality, you know, in the sense that they wanted the South Korean population to embrace North Korea. Yeah? Uh, so they started the sunshine policy, policy for uh, peace and prosperity. So within 2000, uh, 19, 1998 to 2008, there was a lot of contact uh, between officials, not uh, normal civilians, but between officials of North Korea, South Korea, and then uh, South Korea actually invested in North Korea in two projects. Uh, one was a, a factory called um, Kaesong Industrial Complex, and the other one was a tourism project, which is uh, Mount Kumgang. Uh, and these projects were in North Korea. Investment came from South Korea, but the workers uh, were all North Koreans. Very interesting. I went to both the projects, uh, uh, and um, that was the, my experience of uh, going into the DMZ, uh, where I went with a group of investors, potential investors, but I was a PhD student at that point in time. Uh, somehow or other, I got a seat on the bus and I went with these potential investors. And very interesting because the moment you pass by the DMZ and you go into the North Korean um, immigration, they don't let you do anything. You cannot even walk out like five centimeters out of what is um, uh, prescribed, yeah? I was very tired. I get easily. I get tired easily. So after you know getting my passport checked and all that, I did not go straight into the bus. I wanted to walk around. I was scolded by the North Korean soldier. You know, he said, "Don't go in. <laughs> Don't. You're not supposed to walk." And then, be, before we go into the DMZ, we are told not to take pictures of the DMZ because can you imagine? DMZ has been a buffer zone for 50 years at that point in time. So it's actually a nature reserve. And there are so many relics, uh, like uh, abandoned trains, uh, you know, so on and so forth, in, the, uh, in that zone. And people got very excited, of course, and they wanted to take pictures. We were not allowed. And of course, with my luck, the person next to me actually took a picture. Can you imagine, with my luck, the person next to me actually took a picture? The minute we uh, entered North Korea, there were seven buses that went into North Korea that day. All seven buses were stopped because they wanted to know who took the picture. Because you know, when you take the picture, you have the flash, it's flash photogra uh, photography, right? They found out that somebody took and they checked all the cameras. The minute, and I didn't know that the, this guy next to me took the picture because I was sleeping, you see? <laughs> and then when they found out it was his camera, 
they stopped all seven buses. They refused to let us leave uh, North Korea until the officials, um, you know, had to negotiate with the North Korean soldiers, and then you know they let us go. So this is how, even though you know you had two projects and all that. Uh, investors, if they want to invest in North Korea, it's going to be very tough because everything will be controlled. The, no free flow of movement, no free flow of information, no free flow of anything. Yeah, everything is controlled. Yeah, so that's why Kim Jong Un has 14 new uh, uh, investment zones, but I don't know who is going to invest. You, because investment means you need to give a lot of incentives, right? for any company that wants to invest in your zone, right? In this case, they want the development, they want the investments, but they want to control the investments and the movement of the investors, yeah? So we don't know how that's going to happen. Anyway, so Sunshine Policy, Policy for Peace and Prosperity was uh, quite a success because there was interaction between the officials. But when uh, this uh, new... Um, leader by the name of Lee Myung Bak uh, came into the picture in South Korea. He was very upset in the sense that, as I said uh, about the Chonan uh, warship that was torpedoed by the North Koreans, right? That was in 2010. The minute that happened, the atmosphere changed between North and South, yeah? Um, and uh, Lee Myung Bak stopped all interactions with North Korea. <laughs> Before that, South Korea was sending aid to North Korea. Of course, there's no diplomatic relations, but South Korea was uh, sending aid. Lee Myung Bak stopped everything. So um, a lot of uh, analysts actually observed that the tension was as bad as just after Korean War, you know? So they thought maybe uh, things will uh, get uh, worse because Lee, Lee Myung Bak actually wanted to go to the United Nations and um, you know he had two choices one to go to the united nations or to attack north korea because north korea had already attacked a uh, south korean warship yeah chonan but somehow or other with the negotiations by the Euro european union and the americans and the russians uh, things uh, became much calmer but the deed was done in the sense that the relationship was broken forever, yeah? So now, as you know, I'm very proud to say that a woman is a president in South Korea. I'm proud to say this because South Korea is a very patriarchal society. Everything is controlled by men, <laughs> okay? So it's good to know that they have actually chosen a woman to be the president. And she has come up with her own brand of uh, politics, which is called trust politics. And it, uh, the spelling is not wrong. This is how she spells her policy. Yeah, trust politics. Now, trust politics is again, something very similar to the other policies where it says, oh, South Korea will give everything, will give aid, will give development, uh, opportunities will invest in North Korea, and all North Korea has to do is to denuclearize. Yeah, that's the condition that every North Korean, uh, every South Korean leader puts uh, to North Korea. Now, the problem here is, again, for North Korea, the nuclear development is essential. It's a defense mechanism, right? So, the moment. A South Korean leader says, stop denuclearizing, it's not going to uh, help, yeah? And that is not the first uh, uh, issue to look at. The second issue is, there needs to be trust. The name of the policy is trust politic, but there's no trust between North Korea and South Korea. How do you build trust? Someone has to give and take. South Korea will not give until or unless North Korea stops denuclearizing, yeah? So it's like a chicken and egg story, which comes first, the chicken or the egg, you know? So, uh, so till today, it's, a, it's how uh, uh, you can term it as status quo. Neither side is winning, North Korea nor South Korea. Um, and if you talk about trust, the trust also has to come from North Korea. The trust also has to come from domestically from South Korean population because let's say reunification takes place. The economic development between North Korea and South Korea is vastly huge. The gap is very huge. 
North Korea, I don't know how to say what rank it is. I think there is no ranking for North Korean economy. South Korea is number 13 or number 12 in the world. Yeah, So number 13 versus no ranking, which means if reunification takes place, the burden of developing North Korea falls onto the southerners. So if South Korea has to develop North Korea, who, who pays for it? The taxpayers, right? The, who are the taxpayers? The younger generation. Who are the younger generation? Those who, come, like you, those who have come out of the university looking for a job, looking for a husband or a wife, a good husband, wife, looking for a good life, right? So would they want to be burdened by paying higher taxes so that they can develop North Korea? So the problem now in uh, uh, in South Korea is it's generational. If your parents, um, uh, let's say your grandparents, because Korean War happened in 1950, right? So if your grandparents are still alive, they want reunification. Your parents who are in their 50s, 60s might say, yeah, okay, North Koreans are our uh, you know, relatives, distant cousins. Yes, okay, I think we should reunify. But if it's you, you will say, why should I even want to reunify when I have to pay for the reunification? So the youth of South Korea, they are not interested in reunification. Because for them, getting a job is more important, a good job. And uh, the cost of living in South Korea is very high. Um, getting a good job is very difficult because everything is competition. Yeah, because it's a very small country with a large population. Yeah, so everything is competition. Uh, life in South Korea is fast-paced, very, very fast-paced. You go into the train, ten people will push you. You come out of the train, twenty people will push you. You know, you want to go into a restaurant, the line is very long. You want to get a good job, you need to have contact. So these are the things that are important to the younger generation. So the generational gap on uh, reunification is huge, yeah. But uh, Park Geun Hye, the president of South Korea, still talks about reunification without actually understanding that the younger generation will have to bear the burden of uh, reunification, yeah. So now it's no longer North Korea, South Korea, the problem. It's North Korea is a problem. South Korean population is a problem. China is a problem. You know, so the, the, the problem is getting bigger, that is one. Second is the mentality. You are divided more than 50 odd years, 60 years, seven decades, nearly seven decades. How are you going to reunify? How, in what sense? If it's one country, is it two system? One country, one political system, or one country, two political system? What about the uh, economy? What sort of economy, right? So all these things have to be discussed. Okay, that's one problem. The other problem is, as I said to you earlier, it's a war zone. You need to have a peace treaty to end the war. The peace treaty has not been signed because North Korea will not sign a peace treaty until and unless America uh, establishes a diplomatic relationship with North Korea. And America will not establish diplomatic relations until North Korea stops it's nuclear development. Again, chicken and egg. Who gives in? South Korea doesn't want to give in. America doesn't want to give in, right? So again, the conclusion to the seminar or the lecture is there's no conclusion. It is a stalemate. Yeah, everywhere you look, there are problems that have to take into that have to be taken into consideration. It is not just a North Korean, South Korean problem, it is an international problem. Because the, the implications of something going bad, something going wrong, in the Korean Peninsula is very great. Because a uh, very small example, uh, North Korea um, has a nuclear uh, program, but it's not party to the non-proliferation treaty. The non-proliferation treaty is very important because it allows inspectors from the IAEA to come in and check the safety precautions of uh, your nuclear development, right? So when you don't let those um, officers come in and check, you don't know what sort of um, a safety pre precautions uh, North Koreans have. So if someone accidentally presses the wrong button, that's it, there goes the Korean Peninsula. Uh, maybe uh, my country also, because it's quite near to, uh, you know, uh, Northeast Asia, 
right? So it's a very complicated issue. You have policies both sides, but the policies are not working because lack of trust, uh, lack of um, willpower, yeah? And in the North, if something has to change, it has to change from the military or the uh, Kim family itself. It will not never come from the civil society. It will never come from the population because there is no civil society to speak of. There is no space for them to go against uh, the Kim family. No space at all. They are targeted. They are watched 24-7 by the government. So there is no civil society. Yeah. So with that pessimistic note, I shall stop here, and if you have any questions, please do ask. Other countries are, in, international institution is giving carrot to North Korea, and so um, that uh, UN recently is doing the research on the humanitarian ground, right? and that uh, stick policy, can we say that stick policy, and that stick policy could do something in case of North Korea? It might change something. In a lot of cases, example, South Korea doesn't have diplomatic relations with North Korea. So it imposes sanctions on North Korea. But at the same time, it actually sends humanitarian aid to North Korea. Because South Korea, like many countries, looks at North Korea in two different ways. One is the government, the regime, and the other one is the people. So because of the regime, the people should not suffer. So you have your uh, carrot and stick at the same, uh, at the same uh, time. You know, the, the, the uh, aid is given and at the same time sanctions are imposed. But the problem with North Korea, as I say, is it's not integrated into the world uh, economy. So how, whatever sanctions that you impose on uh, North Korea, it doesn't matter, it would not get affected. You know, if, if like, let's say uh, uh, Nepal is sanctioned by America, let's say, right? And Nepal is in integrated into the world economy. If sanctions do happen, then Nepal will be hurt by that sanction. In the case of North Korea, it's not going to be hurt. Everything is cash-based. Everything is money laundering, you know, that sort of a very basic uh, economic system. Uh, through the process of the constitutional assembly, uh -huh. it, is, uh, it is called the most democratic process for making the constitution. How do you view the situation of Nepal? Do Nepal uh, it will divert itself, will break itself into North Nepal and uh, South Nepal in the future, uh, boring your things? How, how do you analyze this situation? I think uh, if I want to compare with North Korea, right? In Nepal, I see civil society is very strong, right? So civil society has the, has the uh, objective of playing a role. And it depends. If you still adhere to democratic principles, then at the end of the day, the will of the people speaks, right? Whereas in North Korea, the will of the people does not exist at all. So at the end of the day, no one can actually uh, predict what is going to happen in Nepal because you must have somehow or other the constitution in whatever form or rather will be, uh, you know, will be established. But that is just a, a document. What happens in elections and after elections and the implementation of policies, that is where it is very important to see uh, how strong uh, Nepal is. And I, I, I understand that Nepal is a very young uh, democracy, very, very young. Yeah. Um, so it would take a lot of, um, how do I say, um, a lot of effort from all parties, including the civilians, the civil society. The role of the civil society in this country, I think, would determine that. And this is kind of like a, a beginning of collaboration with uh, so many universities and academics around the world, because we are studying international region, and most of uh, my friends, uh, they are from the international region, and then they are doing very good in their areas of study in their countries and their universities. So uh, I think, I hope uh, our students will be more active to our Inquiring something from from the academics who are here, all the way, and this great coincidence because our department cannot afford inviting people from abroad, uh, paying the, the uh, like uh, travel expenses, all those things. It is great coincidence that the people from uh, Malaysia and Pakistan, and some other parts of the world, they they uh, quite often like appears here in their own business or it means that academic like all the uh, uh, engagement. So we are just checking. Uh, that opportunity for our benefit in the class. So that I'm really thankful to uh, Gitas and then we hope uh, you, you can you can uh, really uh, keep our CV on our web page and then you can keep in touch with her as well.
because she's uh, like working with uh, so many foundries around the world and then study in Australia, UK and Japan and even in US also. So, so we can in future uh, we can we can get in touch with her and we get recommended for any further st uh, study around the world. So this is the like you no know, don't like underestimate uh, when people come here because this is a really kind of like great opportunity to expose you yourself with people like Gita, so thank you Gita for your presence. And this is a small coconut lot from uh, country of peace uh, with Gita and and thank you for uh, thank you so your much. that I've inspired some of you to work on Korea. <laughs> because actually I'm also a pioneer in my country. Very few people work on Korea and Malaysia. So um, you know, I got interested, so I hope that uh, you would also get interested because it's an area that is very understudied by Asians. It's now uh, mostly Westerners who study on Korea, yeah? Korean conflict. And if you want to work uh, on international relations, uh, political science, you know, issues of concern, this is one area that you can consider. And thank you very much for listening to my ramblings. <laughs> well, uh, she, and, uh, as I told you before, that she did a uh, journal, East Asian Review from Malaysia. So uh, we can we can like work together. If you, yeah. some of you, you some of you write a very uh, good article and then we can like collaborate and then publish there in our journals. It's quite established yeah. journal. I myself have been kind of writing for, uh, for, for a while for a journal, so, so you, should, you should like link up for academic write-up from now on. Um, I, I would uh, really appreciate, I'm the editor of the journal, um, I would welcome any articles um, on Nepal's relations with uh, East Asia, because we don't have anyone who works on Nepal uh, in Malaysia, so that would be fantastic, you know, yeah. China or Okay, we'll, 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 we'll,